Welcome, everybody. I'm not Eve, but Eve and I are good friends, and we teach together. And so she invited me to um, be here today. So first of all, happy Juneteenth. I did a big Juneteenth teaching this morning, and that was really fun to teach some prospective Buddhist monastics all about how they need to be very aware of social positioning if they're going to be leaders in Buddhist space, which I know everybody here at the Dharma Collective tries to be on board with that. So the format for tonight might be a little bit different than what you're used to. What we're going to do is start with just a little bit of settling meditation and set our intention. And then I'll give a bit of the Dharma talk first, and then a guided meditation. And then seeing how we're doing with the time, we might have a little bit of time. Usually love to give a prompt and have people talk to each other a little bit in small groups of about three, and then we'll open it up to a big discussion. So it might be a little bit different than the usual Wednesday night format. We'll have the, the gui a guided meditation practice after the explanation of the topic and the practice. So that's kind of the, the idea, but let's... Just take a couple of minutes to settle, and so I'll just invite you into <clears throat> a comfortable yet alert posture. So we try in our posture to conjoin the qualities of alertness and relaxation. These two qualities are not contradictory, they're complementary. So we get the nice upright posture with the straight back, if we can, as if there were kind of a cord pulling up from the crown of our heads, our shoulders relaxed. Your hands can either be resting on your knees or resting in your lap. Your eyes can either be closed or a slightly hooded gaze. And if you have your tongue on the roof of your mouth right behind your Teeth that keeps you from having to swallow constantly. Your legs can either be crossed if you're sitting down on a cushion or just in a nice stable posture so you don't have to keep adjusting your posture. And after settling into that posture, let's take a moment to just do a body scan, just sweeping the awareness through the body, checking for any tightness or tension or constriction. So starting at the crown of the head and sweeping down, paying attention to the area around the eyes, the forehead, we often hold some tension there. Relaxing the jaw. So if we can, we try and breathe through our nose, not breathing through our mouth, but with our mouth closed, but not clenched. So relaxing the jaw the neck and shoulders, an area we often hold a lot of tightness, just relaxing. Sometimes it can be helpful to imagine something like a warm, viscous liquid, like honey kind of melting through, dissolving any knots. Lifting the chest, opening up the sternum, getting that nice upright posture, but with the body relaxed around it, Relax the belly and the buttocks. All the way down to the feet. And then let's round off this initial settling of the body with three deep breaths. So deep diaphragmatic inhale and exhale. This activates the soothing system of the body and the nervous system. Helps to get us in that calm, relaxed, receptive state. So three deep diaphragmatic breaths. And then settling with the ordinary respiration and just keeping your attention there to the sensations of the breath in the body. It might be the full body awareness of breathing. 
perhaps localizing your attention at the abdomen with the diaphragm rising and falling. Perhaps at the lungs, with the lungs expanding and contracting, or maybe the subtlest sensation at the nostrils, with the air going in and out of your nostrils. So either with a wide angle focus or one of these narrow points of focus, just staying there with the sensations of the breath. And if you notice your mind wandering, get carried away by a thought or sound or another sense object, just release and return to the sensations of the breath. So any thoughts that pull you away, just release and return to the sensations of the breath. And now take a moment to reflect on your motivation for coming here tonight, whether you're joining on Zoom or whether you came in person. Thinking of what brought you here, maybe you're a regular at the Wednesday night sessions. Perhaps you were curious, maybe even something about the topic made you curious to find out more. Maybe you're going through some challenge in your life and you've heard that Buddhist practice has something to offer to help us deal with our challenges. Perhaps you've come for a sense of connection with community, to have meaningful connection with people who are, care about the same things that you do, whatever it may be, and just taking a moment to really Reflect on what movement of the mind, we say in Buddhism, intention is a movement of the mind towards an object. What movement of the mind drew you here tonight? And then we always try to generate an altruistic intention. We might have come for our own purposes, and that's fine. We might have come for our own benefit. No problem there at all. But in Buddhist practice, we always try to also generate a wish that through whatever we experience this evening, whatever insight we might get from 
practice, whatever connection we make with others or insights from the discussion, that it bring benefit to others as well. Whatever benefit comes to us, that we're able to turn that over with that ripple effect that goes outward and brings benefit to others as well. So adding that aspiration, trying to cultivate and generate that altruistic intention. Thank you. And so what I thought to talk about tonight is a, a really basic Buddhist concept that I think can be often misunderstood and can be confusing for us, especially because a lot of us are interested in the field of modern psychology and so forth. and. The Buddha very famously taught a doctrine often translated as selflessness. Anatman is the Sanskrit word. So the Buddha said, you know, there's this selflessness, this doctrine of selflessness that the Buddha taught. And so there can be a lot of confusion about what that means. Does that mean that we don't exist? That we're just sort of in a collective hallucination? that we're not really sitting in this room on 24th Street meditating. And then there can be a lot of confusion because, wait, I've been in therapy for decades and my therapist is really trying to have me, you know, improve my self-concept. And now you're saying there is no self to have a concept about, hang on, wait a minute, how can this be the source of happiness and the source of the ending of suffering? So it can be confusing. You know, we're meant to have a healthy ego, is the Buddha saying, that's not a good thing, and I shouldn't think about myself in that way at all, or shouldn't have confidence, or shouldn't set boundaries, for example. What's what's going on here? So I wanted to try and unpack a little bit, you know, and sort of disambiguate some of these ideas from you know, Western, so-called Western or modern psychological concepts from what the Buddha taught about the self and how we do exist, because, spoiler alert, the Buddhists didn't say there's no self, but the Buddha said we don't exist in the way we think we do. And thinking that we exist in a way that we don't just happens to be the source of all of our problems all of our disturbing emotion, every iota of suffering that we've had, not only in this life, but since beginningless time. So that's a long time. So what's happening here? What is the Buddha talking about? And so the Buddha said, you know, this basic ignorance about the way that we exist is how it all begins, how all of our suffering begins. But it's very subtle how the Buddha said we did exist, because the Buddha said, yes, this isn't a collective hallucination. You haven't been wrong, in my case, for many, many, many decades about existing, and that somehow I'm going to wake up. Remember that movie, what was it, The Matrix, when they're all in the tubes, the fetal tubes, and it was all, it's not like that. So just to be clear, <laughs> deep breath, not like that. But the issue is we think we exist in a way that is not in accordance with reality. And so getting in touch with how do we exist, this very, very, very subtle way that the Buddha described that we do exist. And so there's a, a psychologist who's passed away now, John Wellwood, and he wrote a book called, I think it's called The Psychology of Enlightenment or The Psychology of Awakening or something. Brilliant book. This is back in the 90s or something. And I love the way he kind of unpacks 
these two aspects of what he calls ego, and it's not the psychoanalytic ego like the id, the ego, the superego, it's not the Freudian one, but just this kind of idea of me that we have. And he said there's a functional ego, which is just some sense of you as a discrete being moving through like Sunil and I ate across the street right before coming here and I ate two delicious pupusas. Tense and choky ate pupusas. No problem with that statement, right? This functional ego of like, you know, what you do and you go through and you sort of have this coherent, you know, idea of yourself in that way that functions to keep yourself discreet from others. There's a boundary here. I take care of myself. That's fine. That's not an illusion. And then John Wellwood said, there's another one, and this is the potentially problematic one. And he called it the self-representational ego. And so we have a concept me, right? We have a idea of me, the self-representation of me. And he said, that's the one that can be problematic. And that's more of the one, the false one that the Buddha was talking about that can create our problems. Because not only can it be quite distorted, it can be very fixed and solid. We can carry along a concept that's sort of outmoded, that we've outgrown and we've changed a lot, but we still have this idea of ourselves that we're kind of carrying around. So it sort of has a lack of fluidity to it. That's one thing. It can be very fixed. And we do a lot of our actions are to reinforce that self-representation, ward off any threats to it. In Buddhism, we talk about three poisonous minds, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. So the Buddha would say, this is the root ignorance, is the ignorance about how we exist. And because of that idea that there's some kind of representation of self that's the real thing, somebody criticizes me, how dare you? It feels like it's attacking that thing, right? Or somebody praises you or reinforces that idea of you, and you want them close, don't you? You know, people who feed your ego, who feed that idea of who you are, who you want to be, or like your brightest, shiniest self-representation, anybody who challenges it. Or we could have kind of the opposite thing, imposter syndrome. So somebody tells you you're fabulous and you're like, oh, if they only knew who I really am and any minute they are, and then they'll reject me and oh my God. So we can have that thing. And the Buddha's like, yo, there's no such thing as the real you in that way. So don't even worry about it. You know, the Buddha said, you have a concept of you and so does everybody else. Who's right? Nobody and everybody as a matter of fact, right? So there's this idea and the Buddha said, this is how everything exists that we relate to the world through concepts, right? And psychologists call these schemata. So they say that we have these, you know, we relate to something and then we come up with the concept of it. And from that moment on, mostly what we're doing is relating to the concept and not the thing. Like I know what a chair is. So when I walk into this room, just the tiniest bit of raw data, I label with my mind chairs. I'm not going up and going, Let's see, is it really a chair? I got to figure out in every single one. Do I need to figure? No, there's, I have this sort of generic image. Buddhism talks about generic images, generic image in my mind. And it's kind of like a kid's picture book, you know, a kid's picture book, Apple. They're always red in the kid's picture, and they always have the one green leaf. So you learn. That's an apple. That's the generic image. That's the schemata. So you can go to the grocery store and there's any number of different colors and sizes and shapes. And most of them don't have leaves on them at all, but you can recognize. You don't have to examine each one to see if it's an apple. 
because our mind has to do this interesting balance between taking in too little and too much information. And if we paid attention newly to every single thing in our environment all the time, how could we? It's exhausting. So our mind deals with most of the things in our reality with schemata and just dismisses. I don't have to pay attention to the chairs. I kind of recognize chair instantly with that matching the raw data to my kid's picture book concept of chair in my mind, great, done. Don't need to worry about the chairs. Then I can pay attention to what's novel and what seems like either an opportunity or a threat, because that's what we're interested in evolutionarily, right? So a lot of what is in sort of the background of our lives, we're not really even seeing. We just get a little raw data, we label, boom, done. We're not walking down the streets. So we're definitely not walking through our house seeing what's really there. Things that are familiar do not even see it. Have you ever done, I've done this sometimes, a walking path that I do all the time, like every morning. And every once in a while, I remember one time I was living in the Redwoods and I was walking on the walking path and there's this tree that was down and I was like, when did that happen? And then I'm kind of looking around, it happened like decades ago. And I'm like, what? That's been there the whole time, but it just didn't even register at all because I'm walking down the path, there's no danger, I can just sort of discount and not even really take on board until somehow this one day the new information impinged and I'm like what and I'm looking at the roots and they're all grown up and there's grass and I'm like okay this did not happen yesterday this happened a long time ago so we do that and no big deal with the chair trust me I'm not going to have any attachment or aversion arise these ones they're fine we can sit here for a couple of hours. It's okay. Sort of neutral, not very unpleasant, not very pleasant. But what happens with other people, with certain situations, right? And then we label very strongly and we have strong concepts, right? Friend, enemy, stranger. A lot of our Buddhist meditations we do are all about really trying to kind of unpack the solid concept we have of that's a horrible person. How could they have friends? People go hang out with them Friday night after work and have beer. Oh God, how? They're just from their own side, by their own nature, because we believe in our perception. We believe that's really happening. Buddhism says we label on the basis of that raw data that's what we do, no problem, the schematic thing we have to, because we can't pay attention to everything. I mean, it would be like ADHD on overdrive. What? Chair, huh, rug, you know, you can't do that. So we get the raw data, we label, so far so good, but then we think it's coming at us, however we're labeling it. So if we have that element of subjectivity, like friend, enemy, stranger and then we think oh all those qualities are just coming at me from the side of the object it has nothing to do with any of my filters any of my projections so in buddhism we say we designate or impute onto the raw data and that's how things exist have you ever had a thing i had a thing that happened years ago and you know, you'll meet somebody who's like a twin of somebody you know really well. And so I had this thing, This guy, I met this guy and he looked like my friend. They were from the same place in upstate New York. They had the same accent. They were the same height, the same kind of hair. I mean, they could have like separated at birth, like seriously. And I remember noticing I felt so much closer to the new person. I had to keep reminding myself, I don't really know him. <laughs> because all the raw data was matching up with my concept of my really good friend. And I would catch myself oversharing with somebody who was really a stranger. And I'm like, no, no, wait, that's not because, and it was so weird. And I was already a Buddhist by then. So I really noticed what was happening. I was like, whoa, I'm totally labeling 
bestie onto this stranger because all the raw data is matching that concept I have in my head of my friend. So that was, so we do that, we do that. And so when do people change from a enemy to a friend or the other way around or whatever? It takes a lot of changing of raw data to change our mind. As in somebody who you think is a jerk when you first meet them, and then they start acting really nice to you and you're like, oh yeah, check it out. Now he's trying to manipulate me, <laughs> right? And so even the different inputs, you see through that lens of what you've decided. You've already figured it out. The schemata is already in place, right? And so how much have we done that? The first impressions, you know, and we talk about that. The, you have a first impression of somebody really, really hard if it's a strong first impression, one way or the other, to override that. Because you're not even paying attention to the information anymore, just like you're not paying attention to the trees walking down the path that you always walk. And we do that with ourselves, too. We have a concept, me, that the Buddha said the way we do exist is we label this concept, me, onto the raw data of the ever-changing flow of body and mind, changing moment by moment by moment, mind changing moment by moment, body changing moment by moment, seems to speed up the older you get, harder and harder to get out of bed in the morning, just saying from personal experience, mind changing moment by moment, nothing the same from moment to moment. And on top of those two dynamic processes, we label me, but man, it doesn't feel like that's all that's happening, does it? Feels like there's the real me in there, you know, findable somewhere or solid. In a lot of spiritual traditions, I, I do a lot of interfaith work. And when I'm on these panels with different faith leaders and they're talking about like the main things about their faith tradition, and I'm like, okay, we don't have a God in Buddhism. We don't have an origin story and we don't even have a me. And everybody's like, well, what do you have exactly? And I'm like, it's complicated and very subtle. It does exist, you know, but this idea that there is no findable like a soul. I mean, the reason the Buddha called it Anatman, non-Atman, was because there was an idea in some Indian philosophical schools that there was a part of sort of the ultimate ground of being the Brahman inside of you. And then the goal of the spiritual path is for that to unite back to the one. Buddhism doesn't have an idea like that at all says the way we exist is merely labeled by concepts onto the flux and flow of changing experience of body and mind. But it doesn't feel that way. And especially when someone criticizes you or praises you or you do something you're really disappointed in and you feel something like strong shame, feels really, really solid in there, really, really solid in there. So getting used to this idea of how we do exist, because this is the way we do exist. So selflessness doesn't mean not at all, just means this is the way that we exist. And getting used to this takes lots and lots and lots of practice to kind of loosen that firm, grip of the concept of me. In Buddhism, we have a, in, in Tibetan, there's a, there's a word, Datsin, that literally means self-grasping. And you get this idea of like, you know, just kind of clinging to this idea of self. So many years ago, many years ago now, 20 years ago, oh my God, I was in a, a series of long meditation retreats that I did for a number of years. And I was really working with this, these concepts from Buddhism. And I started really examining my concept of me, like how do I think that I exist? And trying to look at where did the components come from? Because I said, okay, you know, getting to the point of having the realization of I just exist in this very subtle way, you know, labeled on 
this flow of body and mind. I mean, that's kind of the root wisdom that counteracts that root ignorance. But I go, even my sense of me is very distorted, right? There's another level of ignorance that's like the way I'm seeing myself. And where does the way that I see myself come from? And I started sort of critiquing and analyzing and realizing so much of it came from what I was told about who I was when I was growing up. I had an experience, as, as many of us do with my dad, that I felt like he was overly critical and I could never do anything right. So I had really developed this imposter syndrome of like, oh, people think I'm amazing and I get you know promoted at work and they give me more responsibility. And meanwhile, I'm panicking going any minute now, they're gonna see the real me and it's all gonna fall apart. And then I'm looking at that and like, wow, how solid is that? And I gave him so much credit because he was my dad as we do the powerful figure. And then it was during this process of doing these meditations, I go, wait a minute, he's just some guy. <laughs> like, yeah, he's my dad, but he's just some dude with his own projections and his filters and his past and his trauma and the whole, why am I giving him so much power over my idea of me, right? And then I looked at gender and culture and all of these things and started trying, it was sort of like, what is it, the 100,000 layers of the onion, and it wasn't like the core of the onion, but it was all of these layers of, can I just unpack even a little bit and start to breathe some air into this such a solid view of me that I had and start critiquing some pieces that just kind of feel... And I think I was I was helped in this by one of my my best friends who had such low self-esteem, you know, crippling. I felt like crippling, painful, painful to watch, painful to watch. And I kind of felt like, and sometimes I would literally take her by the shoulders and be like, who are you even talking about? I just see this smart, amazing, kind, caring, hilarious. Who's this horrible person you're talking about? You know, but it was so much easier to see from the outside with someone else when they're doing that. And then looking at how much was I doing that to myself, really hanging on to a story and reifying one that was not very beneficial and really held me back and really held me back. So that's the practice that I wanna do with you all tonight is kind of based on this investigation that I did myself when I was in this long meditation retreat to try and break down some of that self-grasping and get a feel for kind of the, the potential of this existing as a flow. Because a lot of Buddhist schools say that's our Buddha nature. Our Buddha nature also doesn't exist as some solid, fixed, findable something in there. Our Buddha nature is our potential. Our Buddha nature means we're not stuck. Our Buddha nature means our mind and body are changing moment by moment by moment. And with the right training can transform into the enlightened body and mind of a Buddha because there's not any findable fix. Wouldn't that be terrible? If we were stuck the way we are now, today, there might be a little wiggle room. Maybe I can be a little more patient and kind, but it's kind of what it is. Whew, thank goodness we don't exist from our own side, by our own nature. To me, it's a huge relief because it means, yeah, with the right causes and conditions put into place, you can actually transform into the enlightened body and mind of the Buddha. That's the promise of Buddhism. And it's because of selflessness that it's possible. This great uh, Indian sage, um, Aryadeva said, because of emptiness, which is sort of another word for selflessness, because of emptiness, everything's possible. If things weren't empty of self-existence, nothing would be possible. So it's the great promise, even though it's kind of scary to let go. We often hang on to those 
ideas that we have of me. I want to read something by um, just a passage from John Wellwood. Do I need my reading glasses? Yes, I do. Pardon me, just one moment. So John Wellwood, in that book, The Psychology of Enlightenment, he says, most of our mental activity is an attempt to prove that we exist, that we are something solid, and that we are okay. Ego maintains itself through the endless self-talk of the busy mind, which covers up any gaps or open spaces in the mind stream. Ego is dying and being reborn at every moment. We continually have to let go of what we've already thought, accomplished, known, experienced, become. A sense of panic underlies these births and deaths, which stimulates further grasping and clenching. Ego contains at its very core a panic about egolessness, an anxious reaction to the unconditional openness that underlies each moment of consciousness. Identifying with the self-concept is an attempt to give ourselves some shape, some hold on things, some security. Experience may change, but at least, so we hope, the experiencer endures. But in fending off its continual impending dissolution into openness, the experiencer gets in the way of its own experience, becoming an obscuration that prevents direct contact with our true nature, with others, and with the larger sweep of life. Wow, right? So that's what we do. We're creating our own prison, our own suffering. I was listening to a talk the other day by Bayo Akomalafe. Does anybody know he's this amazing philosopher? And he said something like, we have to um, go into exile from the plantation of ego. I was like, mic drop moment, <laughs> right? So by letting go, but it's so hard to let go because we think this is giving us security. The thing that's giving us every moment of suffering, ultimately, is the hardest thing to let go of because we think it's giving us some kind of security. So slowly, slowly, one step at a time. So we'll try and loosen a little bit tonight in practice. And before we do the practice, I just wanted to pause for a moment. We'll do the practice and then we'll have time for more discussion afterwards. But just wanted to pause and see if there's any questions at this point or maybe too many questions to even <laughs> begin. But any, anything at all at this point to clarify before we do the practice. That was a lot. We'll experiment. Yes. I really appreciate this topic. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much for reading, sharing, sharing with us. Uh, any, Can you use the mic, please? The mic? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I... I find that schemata, um, is it schemata, is it, did I write, um, kind of gets a bad rep, but it's actually incredibly useful. Like if, if you want to see a human with little schemata, like try walking with a toddler, like, you know, <laughs> getting from here to like sight the last four blocks is going to take yeah yeah you know 2 hours and you're you're never going to end up in that place if you let them lead um so um i i think the the one thing that i'm curious about is when is the right time to mm -hmm. examine schemata like yeah. and and one thing that comes to mind um is a lecture i attended by um Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate, and he, 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 one thing I remember out of many things is when there is tension, it requires attention. Mm. So do we actually examine all the schemata in our lives? Well, that's 
No oh, way. You know, right? I like, don't at all mean to suggest that yeah. because we absolutely needed to function. Otherwise, like you say, we couldn't even walk across the room. Yeah. We couldn't sit down in a chair right away. Um, and what I find helpful, like I mentioned before, is the two kind of these two ways of framing our view of ourselves, the functional one that functions like the chair functions, and I don't have to give it much thought, and I was hungry and I went across the street and ate food. Don't have to unpack that. But it's the, when the self, when the self-representational one, I would say becomes so fixed that it causes me suffering and causes me to have especially attachment, aversion, and the other mental afflictions. And I'll give an example of how this helped me in daily life. So I wish I could remember what I did. I did something that many years ago that because it was me, was probably some misguided attempt to find happiness and avoid suffering, because that's basically my MO, flailing around, trying to find happiness, you know, not doing a great job, but whatever. Probably not malicious intent. That mostly isn't happening. Maybe one person in my life, so there were two people who perceived this event. One person in my life thought it was the most horrendous, selfish act of the most narcissistic, horrible, blah, 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 and let me know it. One person in my life thought it was the enlightened activity of a Buddha emanation trying to teach her a lesson. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm kind of in the middle, just like, whatever, you know? <laughs> but I remember, because I knew this going, oh, there's three different schematas happening in this moment. There's mine, which is kind of medium, there's the, in you know, the total pure vision one of like, this is the emanation of Tara trying to enlighten me. I'm like, well, that's awesome. You know, but for me in that moment, I neither had anger towards a person who thought I was a jerk, nor pride around, like, maybe I am Tara, like trying, you know, neither disturbing emotion arose because I was like, wow, check it out. This is how it happens. So that's how it helped me in that moment to go, oh, that's what we all do. And we all do it. And in this room, there's, you know, 50 tens and chokies. Am I right? And you all are wrong? Nobody's right and nobody's wrong. You know, so using it to, to me, to me anyway, my own personal experience is when I pull out that idea and do some investigation and some deconstruction, it's when it's causing me suffering because I'm having a strong mental affliction attack. And then I go, oh, wow, I'm really hanging on to this idea of me that I'm defending in some way or trying to reinforce in some way. But not when I'm just walking around, filling the car with gas, driving to San Francisco and eating dinner, fine to have a functional self-representation that I don't have to give much thought to. Does that help? That is great. I have a follow-up question. Yeah, yeah. Mike again, yeah. No, this is important, and your uh, questions are great. So so, so just, just repeating what I think I heard is schemata is not bad in and of itself. When there is perceived friction with something or yeah. like that might be a good idea to examine if schemata is at fault. Yeah. Um, the flip side also of it uh, is when a schemata useful and I, I will lead with an example. I don't have a firsthand experience, but I know like folks that are trying to change habits, like potentially around addiction, sometimes say, I am no longer this person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that sounds like creating a schemata to me. Well, maybe updating. Right. If it's just a concept, who created it in the first place? I right. did. So can I update it? And that's one of the faults of schemata when they become concretized. And we believe that that's the reality and we're not updating it with the transforming raw data. Like the raw data is transformed, but my schemata is stuck in the past and it's not up. It's like updating the, what is it, Sunil, you're in IT, updating the hard, what is, 
Yes. Right. It's like updating the software. I knew there was a word for it. <laughs> it's like that. We need to update because we are, whether we want to or not, we're changing all the time. Our body and mind are impermanent. That means changing moment by moment by moment. So if your schemata like mine was, was still sort of the lost 14-year-old, and I believe my dad who perceived me as the lost 14 year old and I'm stuck there and I'm not seeing what's happening. That's problematic. There's a big gap. So I think the schemata is problematic. Yeah. Mostly when we really believe that it's the real thing and it's not just a concept that's sort of helping us move through life and then we're not updating the software. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I think. What do I know? That's what I think. Yeah, Claudia. So what kind of um, practice helps us develop more fluidity and not be stuck? I mean, besides this, ah, <laughs> you know, like the introspection that you were talking about. That prompts the next part of it. Yeah, well, look at that. And there, the Buddha, you know, there's many, many selflessness meditations we'll do this one that i kind of came up with in from my own experience in practice i like wrote this one but there's many in the teachings to help and it's like softening it we don't want to just rip it up and dismantle it but we want to just get it more responsive more fluid breathe some air into it get it more responsive to the changes that we're going through so a lot of the emptiness or selflessness meditations that you find in Buddhism, the one we do tonight might, I've had people that have found this really helpful. Like I said, I just did it from my own experience, but times that I've led people through it, sometimes people are like, oh, I never saw it like that. And then there's some spaciousness starts to kind of arise. So we'll see. Thank you. We'll see. Okay. We shall see right now as a matter of fact so that we have time to talk about it yeah Kate. Oh, just quickly i could maybe wait but um yes. in eve's like practice group we're talking about self-compassion and i feel like a lot of this is actually would help with uh, yes. self-compassion and so i was just wondering if you had anything to say about how these two concepts relate to each other and i think it's that often when we're not self-compassionate is when we're judging ourselves really harshly and we have this kind of harsh inner critic that goes into overdrive but that's very solid too we're seeing our faults and we're really seeing it as who we are you know, in a way, and not just going, oh, I just made a mistake, or I hurt someone, or I'm having a bad day, or whatever, but like, I am fill in the blank. So I think it really goes together with this idea of can we just see, you know, maybe there is something that we did that we're not happy about, but we don't have to solidify and go, I'm just a horrible person and go into the shame spiral that then you know, is very uncompassionate. And it's interesting too, Paul Gilbert and Kristen Neff, who talks a lot about self-compassion, says that the inner critic was actually trying to help us belong, right? Because it's evaluating where are we in the hierarchy of the people that we're with in our lives to try and get us placed properly so that we won't try to be too high in the hierarchy and then be slapped down in a shaming way or put ourselves too low. So we're always monitoring our behavior in relation to other people in a way that's meant to help us. But in our evolutionary past, we had our group of 150 people and that was all that we ever interacted with in our whole life. And we weren't doing that all the time. So it gets into overdrive or comparing ourselves to others. Instead of helping us belong, it's very unhelpful. But another, for me, insight into self-compassion was to know it's not my enemy. It's trying to help me belong and go there, there. Thanks so much, harsh inner critic. I know you're just trying to get me to belong, but I got this. You can just take a break right now. 
but I know you're trying to help me. So we can even have compassion to that harsh voice, seeing that it's trying to help us. So yeah, I think it all relates. Yeah, yeah. All right, you guys ready? Do you need to get up and stretch a minute? You've been sitting, just stand and stretch. Don't like make a cup of tea, please. Unless you really have to, but just stretch. And what we're gonna do for this practice, I'm just gonna prompt you with some things to think about from your own experience. And so the way these meditations are the most effective is just make them as personal as possible and really think about how it relates to your own experience. And then after we do the practice, I'm not sure we'll have time for small groups, we'll see. Or we might just discuss as a big group after the practice. Good stretching. And everybody knows how to stretch really well. <laughs> you did it on command. Stretch. Oh, that was awesome. That was the best. All right. So I'll guide you through and prompt you and just see what comes up. And for these meditations, just like when we're doing a breath awareness meditation, for example, and we notice our mind has wandered and we go back to the object, if you notice your mind has wandered, just go back to the prompt, try and remember the last prompt. Your mind will wander, that's fine. Just re-prompt yourself and see what comes up. So I'll invite you again into your comfortable posture with your back straight. Your hands can be resting in your lap or on your knees, your shoulders even. And we won't do a whole body scan again, but just checking into your body, relaxing anywhere that there might be tightness or tension. And then settling with the breath. <clears throat> I'm just turning your attention to the sensations of the breath for a moment just to get back into your body, into the present moment. And so the first step of the meditation, before we really start examining that sense of self, is to let that sense of self arise really strongly to get a real feel for how your self-concept, your sense of self, how does it feel to you? What are its characteristics? What's your story of me? What's that narrative? And so one of the ways that you can do that is to even say your name to yourself in your mind a few times, or to even say, I, I, me to yourself in your mind. See what images, what thoughts, what concepts arise. really investigating the sense of me. Another way you can do it is to think of a time where you really felt a strong emotion such as fear and anger and a really strong feeling of self arose. How do you seem to exist to yourself? What are some of the characteristics of this sense of identity that you have, your self-concept?
And now, if that sense of self has arisen, if it's become a little more clear, that narrative, that storyline, those feelings, those characteristics, let's begin to examine. Do you think that any of these ideas about who you are may have come from others' ideas about who you are? especially perhaps your parents' ideas about who you were when you were growing up. Maybe something about the way your parents treated you or what they told you about who you are. How much of your idea of me comes from this, your parents' ideas, actions, the way they treated you? And what other about what about other sources from your childhood? Maybe feedback you received from teachers, other relatives, maybe your friends when you were growing up. What about other sources of feedback when you were a child, when you were growing up? And how about other people in your life more recently than childhood? Maybe your partner, your children, your friends. Maybe you're still getting messages about who you are from others' perceptions of you or the way others treat you that are helping to determine that sense of self. And now examine how many of your ideas that you have of yourself are determined by your gender and gender identity. and your culture and its expectations.
How much is conditioned by your personality traits and habits? And do you think any of these ideas about who you are might have been set or fixed from a certain incident that happened in the past? Sometimes in our lives, we'll have kind of a defining incident. Is there something like this that's really affecting your view of yourself? And now examine, is there any aspect of your sense of self that might be historical? For example, you have a concept of yourself that's fixed in time. Perhaps you're relating to yourself as you were in the past, even though so much has changed. And one common thing, for example, with people who've lost a lot of weight, but they still think of themselves as heavy, their concept hasn't caught up with the reality. Is there a way you might be doing this with some aspect of yourself? So much has changed, but your concept hasn't quite caught up. You're still carrying around a historical, outmoded idea of yourself. Is there a way that you're exaggerating some quality that could be distorting your view of yourself?
relay racers pass the baton from one runner to the next? Is there a way you're passing the baton to the next moment? Maybe carrying along an idea of yourself that's outmoded, that isn't really in accordance with how much you've changed. And now imagine what it would be like if each moment were fresh, if your idea of yourself was fluid, if every moment of perception was new, you didn't carry around this fixed idea of yourself that might be distorted, that might be historical, but if you were labeling freshly every moment onto that ever-changing continuum of body and mind. Try to get a felt sense of this. The Buddha said we're merely labeled by concepts on an ever-changing continuum of body and mind, which doesn't exist in any kind of fixed concrete way but is dependent on causes and conditions. Try to get a sense of this ever-changing flow, the spaciousness of this. And then thinking of what Arya Davis said, because of this selflessness, this emptiness, everything is possible. If things weren't empty, nothing would be possible. So can you imagine that this flow of body and mind that you're labeling me could transform into someone with the qualities that you aspire to, to develop your wisdom and compassion, Imagine what's possible.
this is the Buddha nature that the Buddha spoke about, this idea of transformability because of existing in this way and not in this concrete fixed way. So thinking, if it feels right, you can make a commitment that when those disturbing states of mind, of attachment and aversion arise, see how much is due to this self-grasping. Are you just trying to reinforce this idea of how you exist that isn't even true? And just remind yourself when those thoughts arise. Then let's dedicate the positive energy of this practice towards loosening that tight knot of self-grasping, which will eventually lead to the end of suffering for us and all other beings. Okay, so let's see, do we have somebody monitoring the Zoomiverse? Do we have somebody kind of- That's me. Okay, could you put them, what I was thinking was if we put everybody in pairs for five minutes to just share a little bit. I know how to do that, unfortunately. Um, oh, okay. But, um, what, with the breakout uh, room function? What's that? With the breakout room function? I've just never done it. Um, okay. Cage can I can do give it. it a try. Cage said she could do it. Okay. So she's going to do that. Let Cage, if Cage can do it on her end, that's best. I'll get a training so I can do it next it time. It looks like what's happening. What I'd invite you to do, and we'll do it both for the Zoom room and in the physical room, just for about five minutes, because I want some time to discuss as a big group also. Just turn to somebody next to you. We'll just do pairs. We won't reconfigure every, the whole room. And just share anything you feel comfortable about what might have come up during that practice. And the guideline for the breakout pairs is confidentiality, meaning whatever you say to your partner, they will not come back and say to the group or to anyone else in a way that will identify you. So when we come back for the last like 10 minutes to discuss, just talk about your own experience if you have a comment to make. Okay? And otherwise, just sort of turn to somebody near you in the room for five minutes in the Zoom room. Thank you, Cage. <laughs> When I hit close, I'll give a one minute. Okay, we should break okay. down. Okay, now I'll give you a high summary. When we hey, get Kate. to that. I mean, we don't have long. Hey, Kate. I just wanted people to have a little relational minute. Hey, Kate. Oh, yeah. yeah. Quick question over here. Um, 
Everybody disappeared. Hi, Jason. I can. I can. Oh, everybody disappeared. Huh? What was that? Everybody left the Zoom room except for Alice. Oh, that's because they're in the breakout rooms. So, do you? Okay, I'm not in. That's good. I will give a no, minute. No, that's fine. Morning. I'll just I'll just stay here. You, uh, oh, I might have. There is a button to check about co hosts going into the breakout rooms, Wait, and maybe don't, I didn't. Don't worry, check I'll that. stay here. Okay, you stay there, and yeah. um, I'm going to close all rooms, and that'll give a one minute warning to the breakout rooms to come back. Okay, do that whenever. Give it's people a chance. Pretty to easy. It was just in the, those little three dots down in the more, and then yeah. you kind of have to play around with it. But I think I got them all. Yeah, let's, uh, I just need to do a thank training. You. I've never done breakout rooms. Uh, yeah, I had to do it on the flight too. Okay, thank you. So, it's about one more minute. Okay. I think, yeah, just one more minute. So, and then I'll ring the bell when you close the room, and then it will take them a minute to. We'll hope to get everybody. <laughs> but yeah, about a minute. Yeah, it was a quickie, but anyway. No, that's so. Interesting that all these things. literally, I know, like Tara, I met the last day long. Sunil, I came with there's Jorge. That's kind of it. Oh, funny. Where did they all... It's worth doing an exit interview to go, where did you all come from and how did you get here? So finish up your conversation to start to come back. Zoom members should be popping back in 10, 9, 8. Ah, <laughs> magic. <laughs> so we've only got a very short amount of time left, but I'd love to hear if there's any reflections, and we'll invite the Zoom room if anybody wants to raise your hand to with the reflection or the 3D room, whoever might have a reflection on that practice and remembering to reflect just from your own experience and not what your partner just now said. Anything happened during that meditation? No, nothing at all. Yes. Examining all the things. No, there was nothing to find. Yeah, yeah, you want to grab the mic? Yeah. I felt like I came to a thought that like, a lot of these like sort of self um, layers are about sort of protecting me from grief and loss. Um, and like I was saying, the thing that came to mind is some people know here, we have this very old dog and you know, that, that before I go home, I'm thinking, Oh, is he still breathing? Is he still breathing? So I've got this kind of like mm -hmm. tension 
but almost like I'm prepared for something. Yeah. And then when I see him and he's breathing, because he's, he is, <laughs> I feel like, oh, I'm relieved. But it feels yeah. like, but neither one of those feels like it's terribly authentic. But but when I, I'll look him in the eye, when I'll pet him and I'll look him in the eye, it feels like there's this, this moment mm-hmm. that's free of yeah, of, of, all of that story. that stories. Yeah, that it feels like it's like I'm actually just having an experience yeah. without yeah. all of this like what happens to this and what happens to that? And no, 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 you know, that, that's just sort of mm-hmm. really complicated and very panicky sort of story that. And yeah. sort of see, like you say, seeing how much the narrative, like the narrative can be helpful, as we said, the concept we need, the concept to function, but seeing like you have the times it gets in the way of the actual moment to moment connecting yeah. experience. Like I've got such a story and even my anxiety and my panic, which is also functioning to try and prepare you for the loss. So it's not like it's a bad thing. I mean, that's kind of anxiety and worry's job is to get us ready for the unwanted experience. But you can see how when you hang out there too long it actually impedes yeah. the moment so it's like the like one of one of the th- things i was reading the kind of preparing for this and i think it was john wellwood again said you know the balance between making up too many concepts that we're not seeing anything freshly and seeing everything so freshly we we're like the toddler that can't walk down the street and like getting that balance right and kind of titrating for every moment or like adjusting the dial of like oh i want some more immediate experience right now and not so much narrative or like i'm super busy i have to get through the day and i can't notice the redwood tree that's been across the trail for decades that i only do you know And sometimes we make choices that way too, but kind of figuring out maybe when to drop more of the storyline and be more into the felt sense of the immediate. I appreciate you saying that. And I also have this like sense that all of this worry and anxiety isn't actually preparing me for anything that it's actually like just being self preoccupied because what's sort of all about is what did I do wrong? And did I do anything Mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, that it's all connected to other stories. So I don't feel like it. You know, maybe there is a way in which it's sort of rooted in something that was self-protective, but there's also another way in which it just sort of feels like it's just um, something to fill the emptiness. Yeah. Because. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And then, you know, it sounds like also if part of that narrative is what did I do? Could I have done so? It's like we're always doing the meaning making project, yeah. too. Right. Right. And if our mind isn't spinning out the story of me, it's spinning out the story of trying to figure out what the heck is going on in this crazy random world. And maybe there's something we did or didn't do that we could have done different that makes the difference between the thing. So it doesn't seem so chaotic. And that's self-protection, too, even though it drives us nuts. Right. But that's part of, you know, scurrying around to fill in any gaps because there's so many gaps and it's terrifying. Thank until you, you can you. drop into that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, there's a Zoom person. Yes, I can't Elizabeth, go ahead. Name. Hi, yes. thank you. Hello again, how are you? Hey. Thank you for being here tonight. Elizabeth, she, yeah. I, I, I prefer she, her pronouns. Um. So I had um. a couple of, of thoughts that I wanted to just see what you thought of one um was in in examining this sense of self um one of the things that that i noticed was that so for for many years i've been working hard on choosing who i want to be and how i want to be in the world and while i was journeying back to understand you know the things that that Mm -hmm. came before um i realized that it is often at odds with the um, identity that I was given by my my family mm. of origin. Um, yeah, and I was just curious, I guess, if if that was strange or kind of like in the you know expected. Um, and then I also noticed um, that I started wondering how much of who I choose to be in the world is influenced by not wanting 
to be ah, that person. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so even though I think I'm making these choices, that kind of um, idea of the, the karma that flows with you um, and, 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 you know, flows along your journey, um, how much of that is, is influencing. And then the, the last thing I wanted to say just super quick was that I actually loved walking around with my toddler because she did see the world from such a, like a, a, an open perspective that like true essence of beginner mind that like I experienced the world in a much more joyous and fascinating world. Yes, you don't yeah. get very far. And, and so you have to choose <laughs> when you do that. But I, I actually feel like in some ways I want, I want to like go spend time with a toddler every now and again, just to remind me of like how wondrous even leaves are. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Well, you know, yeah. I'll kind of answer the last one first, because there's this researcher that some of you know, and he's actually friends with Eve and was Eve's dad's grad student, Dr. Keltner at the Greater Good Science Center over in UC Berkeley. And he, he researches the emotion of awe and he suggests things like take an awe walk or like focus, maybe not your whole life when you just have to get dressed in the morning and get to work, but choose moments like that to really focus on the emotion of awe and get into it and really look at the puddle like the two-year-old would stand at the edge of the rain puddle and just be like, what is happening? And you're just like, oh God, a puddle right so like to choose when to do that so that's one thing and then i heard you saying almost something about your choices almost being reactive to the narrative that you felt was imposed upon you and i think that can be a first step to breaking free that's not bad and then i think the more you empower your sense of agency and the more you attune to your aspirations, the more it will be proactive transformation instead of reactive. So I think it's okay. Sometimes we kind of need to push back to get free. And then with that freedom and spaciousness, then it can be more proactive and more choiceful, if that makes sense. That's just what comes up for me from what you said. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's 8.30. What happened? You guys, we needed more time for that. Thank you all so much. It was a great pleasure to be with you all. Yeah. Maybe, maybe after, maybe yeah. come see me after. Yeah, because I want to just respect everybody's time and I just noticed what time it is. Thank you so much for coming tonight. It was totally worth driving up from Santa Cruz to see you guys because I haven't been at a Wednesday night in three dimensions and maybe ever. I'm not sure. I usually zoom in, but it was much more fun to be here.